Welcome back to Fusion 24. And if you're just joining us online, hello and welcome. Don't worry if you've missed any talks, um, either um, from earlier in the day or on the other stage, because we will be um, broadcasting them on YouTube in the coming weeks, and you'll receive instructions on how to view them along with the slides. Right, as you heard this morning, Fusion companies and the fusion industry has big ambitions, and with that comes a big price tag. Fusion companies in the private sector have raised more than $6 billion. Most recently, Exmer Energy in the US secured $100 million. Here to explore in more detail how to finance fusion, please welcome onto stage our panel chaired by Marie Fryer of Barclays. Wonderful. Good afternoon. Um, it's wonderful to be here with all of you. Um, Marie Fryer, thank you, Valerie, for the kind introduction. We have a marvellous panel of experts here who've been involved in funding fusion for many years, decades in many cases. So I'm going to introduce them briefly. We have a few topics lined up that will get us started, but we would really love for you to be involved in the conversation. Um, of course, we can have Q&A at the end, but if there's something you want to come in on, as we're talking about it, please do let us know and we'll get the roving mic to you. Um, so I'll pause once in a while and look to you to see if there's something people want to reflect on, comment on, um, disagree with. We welcome disagreement. We hope to have some on the stage as well. Um, but let me start maybe at the far end um, by introducing our panel, Phil La Rochelle, um, who's a partner at Breakthrough Energy Ventures and is responsible for their four fusion investments. Um, also used to work for Google X and across the um, tech, early stage tech and investing landscape. Klaus de Boer, who is the independent chair of General Fusion. He's been around the company for many years, including helping them um, raise their first institutional investor round in 2009, I want to say. Um, Rory Scott Russell, who is head of VC um, for East Alpha, and again, has had an illustrious career around the early stage tech side, especially from an investment perspective. You say you do the, the funky cool stuff. Is yeah, that right. something? Of yeah, course. that's about right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and particularly, um, I'm delighted to welcome um, our esteemed guest, Andrew Lowe, um, um, who is Harris Professor at MIT Sloan School for Management and also the director of the Laboratory for Financial Engineering. Um, if you haven't read his paper, co-authored with Dennis White, published recently on what fusion energy can learn from biotechnology, I highly recommend that you can find it online. And I'm sure we will be referencing it throughout our conversation as well. Um, so we said we should start by really laying out the problem, like a problem statement is always a good place to start, right? Why has investing in fusion, why is that different for typical capital providers? And then I'm sure through the conversation we'll get to how is that changing today and what more can we do to crowd in more capital going forward? So if I may, I'll come to Klaus first and ask him, given he's been around the space for so long, um, to reflect a little bit on your background in VC investing and again, what why were you able to take a different view, but why was it different in terms of fundamentals as an investment proposition, thinking about that risk return profile and, and constraint that typical investors do have? Yeah. Thank you, Marie. And happy to go back in, in time to 2007. Uh, many good things start in pubs. Uh, this was a <laughs> conversation over a pint in a pub in London with a former colleague who told me that uh, he was involved with a fusion company uh, and trying to raise a first institutional round in Vancouver, Canada. As a physicist who started his career on the dark side, I left physics and, and joined McKinsey straight out of university. Um, very intrigued by this. When I was at university, cold fusion had been a promise for a very short period of time. Uh, I visited JET as a student, so I was aware of fusion. Um, but our fund had a mandate to invest in Europe uh, with an investment horizon of five years in a pre-specified number of sectors. I was curious about fusion, so I flew out to Vancouver and um, got intrigued and, and worked on this, uh, this investment case. Um, but it didn't fit within our fund mandate. Uh, so that's one challenge funding fusion, that actually uh, the timelines, the risk profile, typically sits outside of what many funds are set up for. In those days also, there was not a universe one could invest in. There were two private fusion companies at that point in time. Uh, so it was very much sort of an individual investment case. Um, and sort of the way we got around it was, first of all, um, I, had a, I was managing partner of a fund with a single limited partner. So I could go back to the principal and have a discussion around the mandate and whether I could make this fit within the mandate. That, that was one thing I needed to do. 
then the, the next sort of challenge with fusion, particularly in those days, was how do you diligence something like fusion? Uh, who has the skill set to do it? And so we took, contrary to most other businesses we invested in, we took the reverse approach and we were looking for only for reasons why it would fail. Um, and had experts coming in from the plasma physics side, experts uh, from sort of mechanical engineering and systems engineering uh, and, and sort of uh, fusion itself. And they all said uh, it's going to be very difficult, but we can't find obvious flaws in what you're trying to do. So that was the, the way we had to diligence it. And I think that's also something investors uh, struggle with. And then thinking about timelines, the way and, and sort of uh, already in those days, because our fund did uh, healthcare as well as materials and clean tech, um, I used sort of the biotech analogy in those days and said, what this is, we need to fund it through proof of concept in biotech terms through a phase two study and then we'll hand it over to industry who needs to commercialize it. So we also very much tried to structure the original investment as a proof of concept investment to get us to that milestone with the idea that we would hand it off then. Fantastic. And I'm sure we'll get on to more of how, more, how can we do more of that on a go forward. So we've talked a little about the historic sort of um, preconceptions and, and issues with mandates. Maybe Phil and Rory, if you can come in respectively about how you managed to overcome this and how you've managed to invest repeatedly in this space, but also what makes your fund and your strategy different from the norm or the, the vast majority of, of, of uh, strategies out there. Great. Well, I work at Breakthrough Energy Ventures. Um, so we're a venture capital firm that has a bit over $3 billion of assets under management. We've got over 100 portfolio companies. Uh, and the way that we operate um, is that we're basically like a normal, greedy venture capital firm that has a filter on the front end. And the filter is, we will only invest in your company if if it were wildly successful, and I do mean wildly, um, you can reduce at least 1% of, of world uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, now, fusion, uh, if it works, could potentially reduce 100% of emissions of the universe, uh, so that's easy. Um, but I think the challenge then is, can you, putting on your greedy capitalist mode, see a way to make money? Uh, and that's not entirely greedy. It's because the only way that things scale is if markets are willing to invest for them to scale up. Uh, so one of my partners at Breakthrough Energy Ventures has this great uh, line, uh, which is, in order to reduce gigatons, you have to make gigadollars. And so when we look at fusion, I think we all know that it could have an incredible impact when it comes to you know, not only combating climate change and decarbonization, but it's really something that can you know, decouple energy from resource constraints, it can enable sustainable abundance for all. The question is, how do you make money? Um, so the way that, that we're a bit different from the usual venture capital fund, and this is the wisdom of the people who set us up, uh, including Bill Gates and a number of high net worth individuals from around the world, uh, is that our venture funds that we've invested in the fusion companies out of, those are 20 year funds. Um, so because of that, we're able to say, okay, is there a pathway to get liquidity and returns for our investors in 20 years? And what that has practically meant is, could you get the first fusion electrons on the grid in the 2030s? Um, so when we've looked at our four fusion investments, each of them have a plausible, certainly not assured, but plausible pathway that if they get properly resourced, if we work really hard, if we're a little bit lucky, uh, then you can get the, the first fusion electrons on the grid in the 2030s, and we think that that would then uh, give very good returns for our investors within that time frame. Now, going back from that, you then have to say, okay, there's a big market, there's a way that you can get returns for your investors in that time frame. But then what's also very important for the venture math is, are there value inflection points along the way where the early stage investors don't get diluted a huge amount so that it still looks very attractive on the risk reward spectrum? Uh, and the answer for each of our fusion companies is an enthusiastic yes. There's the value inflection points. There is the possibility of getting uh, returns within you know, the fund horizon of our, of our fund. Uh, but what I think is exciting is even for uh, people who aren't set up the same way as we are, there's a very uh, exciting financial story there too. So that's, that's the beginning, but there's a lot more to it. Perfect. And Rory, if you, I could ask you to do the same, talk a little Thanks, bit Rory. about your approach. I, I think our approach is just to be traditional VC early stage investors because Fusion now is a venturable uh, industry. It's just beginning, but I think our, our view, we've made eight investments in the past 12 to 18 months within the fusion ecosystem. So we invest in supply chain, in, in, sorry, in what we call advantaged fusion systems companies. 
these are systems companies that we think will either be uh, national champions in their particular geographies, or they'll be owners of the IP critical technologies, the arms of fusion in the future. Alongside those, we're also investing in spin-outs and the wider ecosystem. So in the UK, we estimate there are around 750 supply chain companies already in, in fusion, that's the Department of Energy figure. Um, there's a huge kind of potential for all of the great minds that come together over fusion in these incredible interdisciplinary teams to then look at other, taking the, the problems of fusion and using those solutions in other markets. So we found companies that started in fusion and are now working in semiconductor design, or they're working in uh, industrial simulation or engineering simulation or industrial control systems or magnet technology, even clean flight. So it's, it's fertile ground. But the, the message that I have is that for an early stage VC investor, and, and we invest across deep tech, but fusion is very much an investable proposition, a VC investable proposition. Wonderful. So we've, so we've talked a little bit about the historic issues. We've talked about where certain funds can invest today, but also why that's still relatively niche. And Professor Lowe, can I ask you to talk about your work and drawing that analogy to the biotechnology space in order to think about the, how do we flip this forward and really open the door for more capital be, to be able to flow and be deployed in this space? Uh, well, I'd be happy to, but first I should mention that um, Every once in a while, my MBA students will remind faculty that uh, those who can't do, teach. And uh, those who can't teach, teach gym. I think that's what Woody, Woody Allen said. And at least I don't teach gym. Uh, but from an academic perspective, uh, we see a lot of analogies between fusion and a number of so-called deep tech uh, technologies that over the years have had to grow from nothing and from this is impossible to this is possible, to this is inevitable. And that's what we see now with fusion. The, 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 the aspect of deep techno uh, technologies that are most challenging are threefold. One, they usually require very large amounts of upfront capital. Two, they often take a decade or two before you can ever expect to have any kind of financial return. And three, the probability of success is either minuscule or totally unknown because it's never been done before. And this triple whammy uh, for deep tech is just very difficult for in typical investors to fund. And so as a result, you need a different set of investors. You also need a different set of financial structures. And if you have those, then you will eventually be able to fund deep technology. So uh, what Dennis and I have been working on on this paper, as well as some other research, is the kinds of financial mechanisms that are necessary to fund fusion energy, and I think there's a fairly clear path. It's not an easy path, but it's one that we've seen time and again with other deep technologies over the course of a few years, including biotechnology. So maybe we can start double-clicking on this, and again, if anyone wants to come in uh, in terms of questions or comments, please do. Um, we talked a little bit about those value inflection points, milestones, the analogy to the biotechnology industry. For those familiar, the FDA in the US has those phase one, two, three trials, which again, for a typical investor, gives them some assurance from a de-risking perspective that a business, or in this case, a particular um, uh, science around a particular disease, has reached a certain milestone. Can we double click on that? What are the kind of milestones that companies in this space can um, lay out for the investment community. In my experience with investors, if you lay it out, you go and tell them about them, then you go and do the first one, then you go back and tell them again, said, look how I told you I was going to do these things, now I've done the first one, you know, and that's how you sort of build that trust. But would you be happy, Phil, to, to sort of speak a little bit more about those milestones and, yeah. and inflection points? Absolutely. Um, so Commonwealth Fusion Systems that you guys have already heard from today, uh, they've got this great framework that I think applies to anyone, as far as I know, kind of pursuing commercial fusion, which is kind of six steps uh, to the light at the end of the tunnel here. Uh, so the first step is, can you control your plasma? The second step is, can you get to three keV electrons? <laughs> the third step is, can you get to 10 to the 19 triple product? Um, and these are all you know, scientific results that basically show that you understand how your technology scales and you know, kind of at least gives you the, the runway to get to break even. The next step, step four, is to actually get to energy break even. Step five is to produce the first electricity. 
and then step six is to produce the electricity cheaply. So, so I think that that's a great framework. Uh, and so whenever we're looking at, at the different fusion companies, we're like, OK, are they on step one, step three, step four? Um, so where the fusion companies are right now is there is one, thank you, lasers, <laughs> uh, concept that has hit step four. Um, but there's a whole bunch that are right at that 10 to the 19. You have to get to 10 to the 21. Um, so that's, in general, what the value inflection points are. But then when you go to different uh, concepts, then you have kind of approach-specific value inflection points. So we've got two magnetic confinement uh, fusion companies. So we've got CFS, which is a tokamak. We've got Type 1 Energy, that's a Stellarator. And there, you get to build on Eater. You get to build on W7X. And really, what you want to show is a component-level advance that furthers these, these, these scaling laws into the break-even regime. When it comes to lasers, maybe you want to build a better laser. You know, Showing you build a, be a better magnet is a value inflection point. Showing that you build a better laser is a value inflection point. Uh, and then you've got our kind of dark horse. Um, we've, uh, Eximer Energy is our laser company. But then we've got Zap Energy, um, which is kind of a fancy lightning bolt. Uh, and they're interesting because they're doing kind of frontier physics every day. So their value inflection points is actually, hey, we're nudging up that triple product. So you know, there are value inflection points galore, uh, building off of a lot of good peer-reviewed science. They're often validated in collaboration with the national labs. So I think something that's very important to get across to the investor community is that this is understandable. You're going to be able to tell when people are making progress or not. And then the last thing, which I'll say, just as a plug, uh, is that you, know, you mentioned FDA trials. There is a great thing in the United States called the Milestone-Based Cost Share Program that is based off of what NASA did with SpaceX. So you know how SpaceX is a many hundreds of billions of dollar company now? Well, a lot of that had to do with this milestone-based cost share program between NASA, SpaceX, and other companies that let them get to these value inflection points, which in their case was resupplying the space station. That now exists in the United States. We just have to fund it a bit better. So there's really a great framework here. And, and you really can understand this in terms of the venture math and which ones are, are working and which ones aren't. Got it. Rory, Professor Lowe, you were both nodding to that. I don't know if you wanted to come in in terms of maybe if we start you with you. Um. Sure. Well, I guess I'd like to step back and ask the question, why do you need milestones? And the answer is pretty simple. If we think about fusion as being 20, 30 years out, that's the same with many other deep tech uh, underlying technologies. And if that's the case, there are three ways of being able to make that kind of horizon investable. One way is that you increase the lifespan of the typical human being from 75 years to 150 years. <laughs> if we all lived 150 years, we'd have no problem investing for 20, 30 years. The second is you can increase the term of politicians from five years, seven years to 20 years. And you know, maybe they do that in China and, and Russia, but not here in uh, the UK or the U US. The third way is to break up those 20 years into smaller bite-sized chunks. And so the point of all of these milestones from the scientific perspective is to understand where you are. But from my point of view, from the financial perspective, it is to make digestible an indigestible investment period. And if you th view it that way, then it actually becomes fairly straightforward. Even with those six milestones that Commonwealth Fusion Systems has proposed, I can see easily taking any one of those and breaking that down into another four or five. And that means that the typical retail investor can get in on the action. And if that happens, we're talking about trillions of investment dollars being available. That's the ultimate goal from my perspective. Very clear. Rory? I'm a simple VC, right? <laughs> so I'm just looking for first revenue, and I'm looking for companies that can get to revenue and get to $100 million scale revenue within venture timeframes. And you might not think that those companies exist but in the ecosystem, but they're here, and that they're in this room. Um, so Tokamak Energy, for example, certainly has a chance of that, both through the commercialization of its magnet technology um, and other technologies, but also as a beneficiary of public-private programs, um, which can easily bring in kind of venture, venture scale revenue. So I think we, we try and make it as simple as we can and say, look, we're, we're looking for venture class opportunities within the fusion ecosystem. Um, now the, the other type of companies out there are these, are these spin-outs, and I can't say enough like how much of an um, inspiring sort of fertile ground it is for, for these spin-outs which, again, make investing in fusion easier from a, from a VC's point of view. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah, it's, 
I think it is venturable, and I don't think we need the milestones. That's my, <laughs> that's my view. Well, well, maybe another way of asking the same question is, as you talk to companies who are setting their business plans and updating their business plans, what are the things that you're looking for? So you talk about revenue generation earlier rather than later. Maybe that means initially a more modest or a side business, right, that allows them to get to that, right. which I, I guess in some ways is a different kind of milestone. We're not necessarily talking about investing in power station com companies building power stations. Yep. Because I, I don't think companies are the companies that exist today. Probably not going to be the companies building power stations with their logo on the outside. Maybe they will, but I think in those those power stations will be built by integrators. They'll be built by EPCs. They'll be built by existing engineering firms that are great at that. The Westinghouses and Atkins and etc. But what we want to find is the companies that integrate those projects that are the the ASMLs of, of fusion, um, and a ASML, you know, we were as a as a fusion spin out. So this is a story, and I, and I hope it's true. I asked Dennis White whether it was true, but uh, um, so EUV technology, which is the basis of e EUV lithography, which is the basis of of ASML's uh, technology, was developed at, in conjunction with Lawrence Livermore. So really, it's, you, you can go. describe it as fusion technology, and fusion technology is in all of our pockets now. So if you think of spin outs. Then you could start to think of ASML as a, as a fusion spin out. And that's a $500 billion deep tech company, which is two times Shell, which is, <laughs> which the, these are the kind of companies that we, we could see emerging and we want to be investing. In terms of value yeah. Gen uh, uh, yeah. generation. Um, we talked a little bit about what the, was there a question? Um, no, what the milestones were um, and the investor perspective on those. I just wanted to see if there was any companies in the room that wanted to reflect or ask specific questions about what. What, how that works in practice, or how our investors think about it, or equally, if there's investors in the room that want to ask from the, for the corporate perspective. Yes, there's one in the front here. The gentleman in light blue. Hello, sorry, I'm not an investor. Um, how do investors um, understand and manage technical risk um, you talk about milestones, maybe not reaching those milestones because it's a very complex and novel technology. How do you do that? Who would like to go first? Phil? Well, um, <clears throat> this will be a, a rare thing to hear from an investor, but we, we try to be humble, um, which means that we recognize the extreme complexity uh, of, of trying to pull off these fusion projects. So at least for us, of the four things that we've invested in, um, we rely heavily on, on peer review. Um, that either the companies themselves or the basis for their design has a long history of, of peer-reviewed uh, publications, that it's taking a bunch of measurements, that it has a hypothesis as to what the scaling laws are, and has basically put it out to say, hey, you know, if you think these scaling laws are wrong, let's, let's debate it openly. Um, so, so that's how we do it by concept. And then when it comes to individual companies, you know, this is not unique to Fusion. We do it across, you know, um, our 100 plus companies, everything from fusion to fake meat with some rockets and VTOLs in between. Um, so we have a framework for doing that. And when it's necessary, we bring in some great experts where we really feel like there isn't the basis of peer review and, and we need to go that extra click. So not a simple answer, but especially with fusion, for us, you know, peer review is kind of table stakes. Can I add to that? I, 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 I certainly agree that whenever possible, you should bring in experts. But the very basis of your question is when you're at the very early stages, and even the experts don't know, the way to deal with risk is the way that financial um, uh, investors have been dealing with risks for generations, which is don't put all your eggs in one basket. Invest in a bunch of these different technologies, and the idea is that if you invest widely enough, then the likelihood that one of these things will work is gonna be higher. So I think ultimately for the really early stage technologies, after you've exhausted all of the expertise that's available and there's still unknown unknowns left, invest in everything. <laughs> <laughs> Rory, did you want to come in on that as well? I think there's, there's portfolio diversification of technology risk. Um, but I think what's changed recently is the market risk side of things. So now with more and more announcements of national commercial demonstrator programs, um, with more and more companies available to actually fusion companies who can be who can provide demand for fusion systems, the market risk is reducing. 
which, because we can cope with technology risk or kind of market risk, but if we're deep tech investors, we should be specializing in technology risk and hoping that that market, you know, if, if, if they build it, there is demand. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing now, and I think that's why hopefully they'll be a lot more interested in early stage, at least, tech investing. Was that helpful? Thank you for the question. I think that's a great point in a moment to pivot towards the demand side, but I just wanted to check if there was one more. There's one on that side, please. Gentleman in the suit. I was about to say, that wasn't very helpful, was it? <laughs> Says the woman wearing pink. So. <laughs> I have a gentleman in a suit. Um, I'm Ian Chapman from UKAA. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in the relationship between private sector funding and public sector funding. Um, you know, nobody knows which is going to be the optimum fusion power plant, but knowing a bit about fusion, I really can't see a way of delivering a first power plant for less than sort of $10 billion, and it'll probably be significantly north of that. Um, and that's really hard to fund, right? So even known energy technologies in the UK almost all of them require some public intervention, either regulated asset base or PPAs or contracts for difference or subsidy or tax breaks or some sort of mechanism to make it a viable project. What do you think is the best way for that interaction to work in fusion where it's novel technology, first of a kind, high risk? What do you think the role of the state is in working with you? Anyone would like to volunteer to go first class? Thank I, you. Uh, I'll, you know, a few few perspectives on this. I think, uh, well, first, what we see at the moment is that every single government is uh, putting fusion programs, fusion strategies together, or at least starting to think about it. Um, I think what, what came up earlier today here on the, the panel before lunch is the, the topic of energy security. So it, it, there is something about producing a commodity called electrons that needs to be cost competitive, but there's also the dimension of, of energy security and how that fits into industrial policy, um, seeing uh, industry leaving Europe in droves at the moment because of energy costs. So I, I, I think if you factor that dimension in, uh, that, that helps. Um, another example that, uh, that I see at a smaller scale, so we're not at power plant scale yet, but sort of the investment instruments that are available, uh, there are countries that have growth funds, and those growth funds come with a mandate, uh, the topic I, I, I raised earlier. Uh, but typically, a growth fund means investing in EBITDA positive companies uh, with a minimum revenue threshold. And so when you think about how you put government instruments in, in place, and if those instruments are supposed to support fusion, then you also need to make the mandate uh, such that that fusion fits within it. What is happening here in the UK, and we were supposed to have a, a government representative on this panel, I think, uh, but given that we're in election season, uh, that's not possible. Um, I'm very part-time involved in Future Fund Breakthrough, which is a UK government fund uh, as an external investment committee member. And in light of the challenges of funding deep tech in the last couple of years, uh, the board of this fund have decided in order to achieve its policy goals, they needed to change the parameters of this fund. So allowing smaller round sizes, allowing uh, corporate VC led, uh, led, led rounds to, to price deals. So I, I think there's also that flexibility that is, uh, that is necessary. But th the world that I see is still one step before uh, what you're referring to. Please. Um, yeah, if I could weigh in, um, I think this is where looking at the biotech sector could be quite instructive. So I think all of you know that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in medicine these days. You, the mRNA vaccines have, have saved the world a few years ago, uh, but uh, you know, gene therapies, all sorts of incredible breakthroughs. Where did they come from? Why do they exist? Why is the biotech industry so vibrant today? It's because government has played a critical role in funding the things that investors will not fund, which is fundamental science. Uh, if you just look at the United States as an example, the National Institutes of Health has a $40 billion annual budget. They invest $40 billion a year in fundamental science. And not surprisingly, a lot of those ideas generate intellectual property that is then commercializable, which is why we have low-hanging fruit. It was estimated 10 years ago that the war on cancer that was declared in 1971 uh, ended up putting $100 billion of taxpayer money into fundamental scientific research just on oncology which is one of the reasons why last year the FDA approved 37 new cancer drugs, 37 in a single year. 
So I couldn't agree with you more with the sentiment that government has to get involved. But from my point of view, what should the government be doing? It should not be investing in companies that the private sector invests in because that's why you have government to put money where the private sector will not put money. So in my view, they ought to be funding things like fundamental science that's necessary for the private sector to take that next step and commercialize. And I think having that kind of public-private partnership that we've seen in biotech would be enormously important and, and in fact essential for fusion to become a reality. Maybe we can double click on that slightly, and I don't know if you wanted to come in, Phil, as well, but around what those mechanisms then actually are that allow to bridge that. And you re referred to the DOE's program, obviously, earlier as well, but... Yeah. I mean, it's a program so nice, I will mention it twice. Um, <laughs> the milestone-based cost-share program, in addition, look, we're only here because of decades of government investment in science. That should not stop. That should continue. Whatever you've heard, there's still a lot of science and engineering to be done on all the fusion concepts. So that needs to continue exactly like Andrew said. Um, but I will say that government can be an amplifier for private capital here through the milestone-based cost-share program. Because why this program is so good is that the government and the companies set the milestones for where you want to go, and then it's private capital that has to take the risk, and the government only pays if they actually achieve the milestone. Um, so the equivalent of this in fission has been appropriated to $2.5 billion, not quite to the 10 that we need, but it's certainly a good start. And if you significantly uh, fund that program, it's going to really open the doors for a bunch of private capital that's sitting on the sidelines that wants to have that additional kind of two-key system of, are these companies making progress? Um, so again, the science is absolutely necessary. I would love to see it funded as much as the NIH. But in addition to that, just like what NASA did with SpaceX, if you want to speed commercialization, which is a very good you know, public investment for the good of all, uh, then the milestone-based cost-share program that they're doing in the United States, that needs to be appropriated more, and I'd encourage other co countries to consider the same thing. Please. I couldn't agree more, um, but we should, we should mention the UK as well in this, the STEP program, that, that approach here. The, the government as a demand, as a, as a, as a customer. Mm -hmm. Demand signal, uh, yeah. Well, as a customer itself, yeah, yeah. And, and governments can be good customers. I know VC, <laughs> we don't like to have big government as, as customers, but but in deep tech, the government can be good customers. So, so I think in, it's, about, it's about the government being a, a good customer um, for young early stage companies. It's, it's also about these integrations between existing large businesses, particularly engineering firms that can and that have the existing supply chains and know how to integrate fusion technologies into big government projects. And then I think you can get billion dollar outcomes from, from fusion investments. Can I put in a plug for the governments to actually increase their level of funding yeah. to multiple billions of dollars? Well, here, here. And I, I mean, th this, is, this is just basic math. If you look at what it's going to take, I think governments play a critical role. And you know, as I mentioned earlier about the, the duration, the terms of politicians, in China, where the term of a politician is probably longer than 20 years, what are they doing? They're doubling down on fusion and investing extraordinary amounts of government money yeah. to make it happen. So I think that the younger generation there needs to start talking to the politicians about dramatically increasing support for fusion energy programs. Which, please. Just talking about China and thinking of the potential for a Sputnik moment um, with a great breakthrough coming from, from the Chinese fusion research programs massively funded by the government and what kind of impact that would have on supercharging um, fusion development. That's quite and all spin out technology. And all spin well. out. I, I, exactly. I mean, what, one stat that I read is that of all VC uh, fusion investment in the past five years, only 3% went to Europe. 3%. Three, 3 <laughs> and, and yet, Europe, I mean, particularly the UK, has a case that it leads the world in fusion technology just because of the, oh, the, the history that we have here around Column and the JET program, etc. But 3%. Now, that's, that's a similar to number that, that VC investment went into um, LLMs and generative AI. And in the UK, I don't think we have a foundation model. So that, that's how we can get left behind if, if, um, if at least in, in certain governments that don't kind of promote this industry.
class. Yeah, I want to add one other dimension to it, and it was mentioned briefly before, and it was the, the vaccine program and the success thereof. I think that it's a very imperfect analogy, but there are some things we can also learn from that, because normally it takes 10 years to, to bring a new vaccine to market, and when it really was necessary, we could do it in one year. And how do we do that? Uh, by the government assuming risks that the private sector normally would assume, exactly. but in this case, the government assumed those risks. Yes. It was also doing everything in parallel. If you're running a fusion, company on limited venture funding, you want to spend your dollars to take the most risk out of your program for those dollars to get to the next phase. But there are also lots of things that need to be done in parallel uh, that uh, is done sequentially because of, of the funding. And I think those are areas where governments could also step in and fund programs that address common problems across the industry to take that risk off the table for the private sector, but actually shorten the time to market for the private sector. Mm. Do you think the emergence of massive data center demand could potentially be creating those conditions at the moment? How does, how does Microsoft build gigawatt data centers with 100 billion type scale budgets? How, how do they supply? If they're building those sorts of things in Germany, if they're building them in Poland, if they're building them in Uttar Pradesh, those are running on coal. Does uh, how does Microsoft, I mean, Microsoft and other data center providers, how are they going to be powering these massive data centers to take advantage of AI. Well. I, would just, I was just going to reflect that in my, in my experience, just in the last few months, this has really started to come into every conversation about um, energy supply um, alongside the decarbonisation uh, priorities. Perhaps as the moment is happening now. Yeah. Anything else from the audience? We have a few more minutes. So there's one or two other topics we wanted to touch on. But I wanted to see if anyone else wanted to come in. Um, we touched very briefly on the demand and the markets more broadly. I just want to spend one more minute on that um, and think. Uh, so we've obviously talked now about one potential further uh, demand driver, but that confidence and in terms of how is it sort of practically now becoming part of the investment story from the capital perspective. So had a very brief conversation earlier on PPAs. Um, are we now really at that point, which I think is where, in my experience, a lot of the investment community is dated in their understanding of where the industry is in terms of its progress. Um, and if that's really what we're now talking about, I think all of a sudden, and I think that's the whole point of this conversation, right? Had we broaden the reach of the sector into the capital provider universe um, beyond it, its currently slightly more niche space. So I don't know if anyone would be willing to share a little bit of feedback on that. Well, to, to just build on what was mentioned before, um, this new demand that is coming from uh, compute generally, driven a lot by um, excitement about AI, um, you know, here are people who have an extremely valuable industry that they want to deploy, which is being limited by energy. And so there is some willingness to pay there and, and ultimately, you know, the people who are very bullish on AI, what they're looking for is basically a social license for infinite energy consumption. Um, and so that is one of those wonderful things you look for in any climate change company, which is product differentiation. And so the people who are willing to pay more for, you know, dispatchable, match to load, carbon free uh, energy, especially one that can be deployed anywhere, that's a very interesting market. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had one of our geothermal companies, Fervo, who has had an agreement with Google, I think they just re-upped it to be even bigger, uh, to do offtake for geothermal um, for their data centers. Obviously, there was already the agreement between Microsoft and Helion. Um, so seeing that market pull uh, is very encouraging. Obviously, we'd like to see that from governments as well. Governments might also like this idea of you know, energy decoupled from resource constraints. Um, so we're starting to see uh, both in the private sector, and we hope increasingly in the public sector, just like you saw feed in tariffs, et cetera, of people realizing why it's appropriate to try to help this technology get to market and get down the learning curve. Laura, did you also want to? I think we, there's, there's electricity as a, as, a, um, as, a, as a demand, but there's also heat, industrial heat. So it seems it's quite easy to mix up energy and electricity. And, and in the US, I think it's only about 40% of energy goes into electricity. And fusion has unique characteristics. Um, and one of those unique characteristics, and we were talking about this the other day, was is it's the the high quality industrial heat output, which can be used to decarbonize steel. Not only decarbonize, but bring those industries back back onto friendly shores, for example. So, steel production, petrochemicals. These might be the go-to markets, if you like, for the first kind of fusion systems embedded within existing, for example, petrochemical plants in in, say, Rotterdam or Singapore, 
Those could be the first foots, as well as data centers, et cetera. From a demand point of view, that could be that kind of go-to-market niche. That sweet spot. Certain technologies. Yep. Fantastic, thank you. So in the last few minutes, I really wanted to spend a little bit more time on practical pieces. Um, in our prep session, we talked about CVC strategic investors, are there more open, but also the route to a public listing to an IPO and what's required of these businesses. So maybe we could take them in turn. Klaus, would you be happy to comment on either before? Well, it, I mean, uh, one sort of comment on, uh, a generic comment on that is, uh, I was reflecting on this over lunch um, and Today, we're having this event, just like last year, in the Science Museum. And I think if you moved slightly further east in the city of London, you could move to the Royal Academy of Engineering and <laughs> sort of position fusion slightly differently. And if you keep going east, you go via the government in Westminster, ultimately <laughs> to the city of London where the money is. And yeah. so I, I think also <laughs> as an industry, <laughs> if, if we think about where we organize this event and what messages do we want to send, uh, organizing it here sends a certain message. And, and I think we're further away from the source of funding here uh, than we would be in, in the city <laughs> of London, uh, because we're largely talking to ourselves in this room. Uh, so that thinking about being public, um, I think as a pre-revenue company with a long time to revenues, uh, there's only one way you can go public, and that is if you raise three times the amount of money you think you're going to need to get to, uh, uh, to where, where you need to be in revenue generation. I think being out there uh, unfunded in public markets, as we've seen with, with a lot of companies that went uh, public via SPACs in the last few years, they're all struggling dramatically because all of a sudden uh, you're, you're exposed and, and people sit on the sides and wait. So I, I think public markets will be there at the right point in time, uh, and we can talk about the conditions that we think, but that's probably more your uh, cup of tea than, than ours as well. Um, I think it's too early for that. I think uh, we can get there, but it starts with education and taking people on the journey. And at the moment, I don't think we're doing enough education in those markets. Got it. Maybe we'll have Rory and Phil, and then we'll give the last words to Professor Lowe. <laughs> I, think, I think I couldn't agree more with class, really. I, I, you know, public markets will want what public markets want. And when, when there is a company that satisfies those conditions, there'll, there'll be some exciting exits. But it's going to be interesting whether the kind of first exits for Fusion and VC are going to come from public markets or they'll come from M&A. Let, 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 let's see. Let's see. Well, I, I'll just say that what's been very refreshing in seeing the growth of our Fusion companies, um, seeing them start from university spinouts and, and other places and then raising hundreds of millions and then even billions of dollars, is what's really exciting is the classes of capital that you might say, oh, they'll never invest in Fusion. They're actually a lot more receptive than you think they might be if they think it will actually work. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's a lot of the story that you have to tell. And then Andrew uh, can then say how we get to the public markets. <laughs> well, so I couldn't agree more with Class's observation that you know in this audience, in this particular location, we're talking to the converted. We need, but instead of moving to the you know engineering area or Westminster, I think we should be doing this at the O2. <laughs> that, <that's laughs> what we're Raise the game, just well. So, uh, in order to get public markets involved, mm. you need to have widespread understanding and acceptance of the technology. And how does that happen? So, I uh, agree uh, wholeheartedly that we need to do more education, but it's not just education. We need to do more outreach, mm. and I think that outreach. Uh, sadly, or, or for, for better or worse, re relies on spokespeople and particularly celebrities. Mm. We need to get celebrities involved in this. You know, Lionel Messi or, uh, you know, <laughs> the Anyone TikTok Anyone got any generation. mates that we could use here? Please come forward. I, I am serious. Uh, in order for us to get that level of acceptance, in order for us to get financial institutions like Barclays, your employer, mm. to be able to take it seriously mm. and to spend time with the financial analysts talking to various different sources of capital, we need to have a groundswell of support. Mm. And I don't think it's that difficult to do if we can corral the right individuals to work with us to do it. Well said. And I'll just say one thing, which is that we are very happy that Robert Downey Jr. is an investor in CFS because they are both building arc reactors. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you for the questions. And thank you to the panel for your insights. Thank you, Maria. I think 
everyone would agree that you have been a masterful chair of this um, session. Before we thank our panel again and take a short break, I'll remind you that we start again at 10 past three now. And on this stage, our panel will be discussing the new markets that Fusion is creating, is starting to create. While in the information age stage on uh, level two, we'll be exploring how to attract, retain the Fusion workforce of the future. Please put your hands together and give a great big thanks to our panelists, Marie Fryer, Andrew Lowe, Rory Scott Russell, Clasterbert, and Phil Rochelle. Thank you very much. <laughs>